안녕하십니까. 제17회 제주 포럼에 참석해 주신 여러분 반갑습니다. 지금부터 한이오 라운드 테이블 혼란과 분쟁의 시대 평화를 위한 과학기술인의 역할 세션을 시작하겠습니다. 본 행사는 동시통역이 제공되며 통역을 원하시는 분들께서는 자리에 놓여있는 수신기를 착용하시기 바랍니다. 한국어 채널은 5번, 영어는 6번입니다. 그러면 세션의 진행을 맡아주실 좌장님을 소개해드리겠습니다. 좌장님은 제주알라대학교의 김종아 교수님이십니다. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 17th Jeju Forum. Thank you for joining us today for Korea U Roundtable, the role of scientists for peace in the era of chaos and divisions. Simultaneous interpretation is available for this session. For service in Korean, set your device on channel 5. For English, select channel 6. Now, I would like to hand over the stage to Professor Kim Jong Hwa, who will moderate this session. Everyone, please welcome Professor Kim. Good afternoon. Well, I want to welcome you all to the Korea EU Roundtable, the role of scientists for peace in the era of chaos and divisions. As introduced, I am the moderator, Kim Jong-hwa, professor at Jeju Hala University. So, as you're well aware, we, the humanity, are at the long tunnel of COVID-19, and we are in the midst of the new normal era. We have the Ukrainian armed conflict, U.S.-China conflict, and environmental disasters caused by climate change. And in particular, Europe is suffering from the largest drought in 500 years. More than that, the global economy is showing signs of a Great Depression along with unprecedented uncertainty. So in this session, we have invited scientists and engineers from Korea and Europe and discussed the role of scientists and engineers, how to overcome these conflicts, what we can do. And we will have a discussion. Now, let me introduce our speakers today. First, our keynote speaker, Chairman Che Yun Sok of Aviation and Railway Accident Investigation Board. He worked for 23 years at the Korea Aerospace Research Institute, and he has been researching liquid propelled robot engines for 23 years. In 20, 2002, he was appointed the director of the Korea Aerospace Research Institute, and he started there the construction of the Naro Space Center and started the development of Naro Space Launch Vehicle. He was awarded the Korea National Assembly Science and Technology Award and the Order of Science and Technology. Second speaker is Professor Egon Vandenbroek. Professor Vandenbroek is currently a professor at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. He has his social science PhD and electrical mathematics PhD and computer science. Professor Van den Burg is serving as the European Commission's chief expert on AI and big data. Our third presenter, Dr. Lars Larsen from Germany. Dr. Larsen works at the DLR Center and he's the leader group leader of the Carbon Material Assembly and Bonding Technology. And he also received his PhD in Computer Science from the Augsburg University of Germany. He also is an expert in AI-based collaboration technology for industrial robots. Our first speaker from Greece, Professor Stefanos Kolias. He is currently a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the Athens National University of Technology, Greece. Since 2019, he has been chairing the Greek National Research and Technology Infra Institution. He also contributed to the digital transformation of the Greek digital governance government. And he, as a professor, he has 12,500 citations to his papers. 
so he's a world-class scholar in AI and computer vision. Our fifth speaker, Professor Faji Kaiarainen from Finland. He's currently a professor in the Department of Applied Physics at, East, at Eastern Finland University. The professor also leads the Biosignal Analysis and Medical Imaging Research Group. Professor Karjinalainen is the co-founder of Adamant Health Company. And the and professor also acts as an academic advisor. Good. Our sixth speaker, Director Jo Woo Hyun of Korea EU Research Center. Director Cho worked as a senior researcher as, at the National Research Foundation of Korea for over 20 years. He has a master's degree in mechanical engineering and a doctorate in public administration. So that was a brief introduction to our panelists. Please give them a big round of applause. 자, 그럼 지금부터 이제 보... Now let us begin the session with the first presentation by Chairman Che Yun Sok. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Che Yun Sok. I am here to present the keynote speech in front of you today. It is my honor to serve as a keynote speaker. As a scientist, it is unfortunate to discuss the role of scientists for peace in the era of chaos and divisions. Now let me start my presentation. As you're well aware, we are going through COVID-19 and you are wearing a masks. Starting the end of 2019, we are under the COVID pandemic situation. When the shape of COVID-19 was announced on the media, I was surprised because it was very similar to the sea mine used during World War II by the U.S. troops. As you can see in those two pictures. And this picture also reminded me how terrible the COVID-19 is. Starting from early 2020, the entire globe was under despair because we didn't have any treatment or vaccinations or we didn't have a vivid symptom. However, faster than any other time, scientists came up with vaccinations and treatment. To overcome such a pandemic, scientists have played a great role. One of the reasons why we have COVID-19 is regarded as a environmental issue. After the first industrialization, scientists want to help the world to be more convenient and boost the economy. Therefore, they focused on inventions. There are lots of inventions that helped our lives easier. However, that required a lot of fossil fuel and electricity. To create electricity and power, we have to use more of the uh, fossil fuel, which deteriorate the environment on the globe. 
this is sorry this is a photo from a Korea Aerospace Research Institute you can see a lot of clouds in the air and that shows the difference between 2011 and 2019. And you can see the steady trend of the increase in global annual CO2 emissions. It became almost double for the last 50 years. When we went through severe COVID-19, a lot of factories shut down and suspended their operation and actually, that was a good opportunity to recover our environment. According to NASA's material, this month, this summer was really hot. We didn't have enough rain. And that means that our lakes and rivers were dried up. Glaciers were melted. So you can compare the picture in, on the left and on the right to compare how much glace, glacier are melted. And in the picture on the left, you can see there are some places with over 40 degrees Celsius during the summer. To reduce CO2 emission, the world is making its effort, but we need a lot of time. It is highly related to economic growth of each nation. At the same time, our globe needs some break from CO2 emission. If you think of a war and science and technology, as you are well aware, It's been months since Russia and Ukraine are having the war. However, unfortunately, there seems to be nothing scientists can do to stop the war. Rather, scientists and engineers are doing a lot of research and development to help their country win the war. You know the company called Starlink, the CEO Elon Musk has provided 3,600 devices that can use Starlink to help Ukraine. That was a good opportunity to promote Starlink during, among the general public. If you look at the Starlink project and space environment, SpaceX, an American space company, started Starlink project in 2019 to build a international internet communications network. This Starlink project by 2025 plan to secure the world's international communications and wireless communications network by launching 12,000 satellites into low orbit of 500 kilometers. The first artificial satellite was launched into space in 1957, and by the end of 2021, 82 countries for the last 64 years launched this 12,000 satellites. However, Elon Musk's Starlink project plans to launch 12,000 satellites by 2025. And so far, it has launched 2,700 star satellites. So that means that Elon will launch a satellite similar to the number it has launched around the world for the last 64 years. Once Starlink project is completed, Starlink satellites 
cover the entire globe, as you can see in the picture. And by 2030, Starlink plans to launch 70,000 satellites. Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX, plans to launch and test the super large Starship soon to move a people to Moon and Mars. It can launch 100 tons of spacecraft and also can launch 400 Starlink satellites. Once it's completed, we are going to be covered by Starlink satellites all over. Europe and China are going to launch a lot of satellites for low Earth orbit communications. Once launched, satellites cannot be cleaned until decades, until it enters the atmosphere and burns. In the early days, satellites launched and it's still orbiting the Earth. Spaceships or satellites launched into low Earth orbit, and sometimes there's a big problem of a collision. As you all know, the only place in the solar system where humans can live is Earth. So we need to preserve the Earth. Environmental issues of space is not as imminent as climate change as we discussed right now. However, there will be a great disaster if we don't keep ourselves in mind. Recently, Korea also launched a exploration vehicle to the moon. Moon is the Earth resources warehouse. If we can bring uranium and helium-3 from the moon and use it, it will help us solve the problem of the Earth's energy issues. The technology of a nuclear fusion can solve the energy problem of the Earth as a next core technology. If you generate electricity with the uh, nuclear fusion technology, you can solve the greenhouse gas problems. And I hope that fusion technology will develop anytime sooner. The space is a place that mankind should use together for a very long time. So we need a long-term plan. Both the environment of the Earth and the environment of the low Earth orbit are very important to us. It's very late. However, we still have time to think about the roles of scientists for peace and saving the world. When I was a kid, my parents asked me to go to bed early and get up early. It's probably because they wanted to save the electricity. And I got to understand that. And using a, the public bath and riding a bus is the first step to love the planet Earth. And today, it would be a great opportunity to listen to European scientists' opinions today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Che. My parents also used to tell me that I should go to bed early and wake up early. And I didn't really listen to my parents, but after listening to you, I just realized that I could have contributed to 
the environmental issues by going to bed and getting up early and saving electricity. Now, let us move on to the second presenter. In empathy, it is Dr. Egon van den Broek will present on signaling and empathy. Professor, please go on. Thank you. Um, I want to join two distinct uh, topics, namely singling and empathy. So I discuss singling, signaling trends, communication, uh, a Netherlands perspective, empathy, and I will close with a take home message. So Bertrand Russell uh, said that it is coexistence or no existence. He limited his statement to humans, mainly directing it to politicians. I propose to extend it to all aspects of humanity, for example, including religion, and also our coexistence with nature, our planet. We only have one. So we can signal trends at several levels. So mentioned before uh, the climate issues. So we see some uh, resemblances between Korea and the Netherlands, but also some differences. So Korea in general is more vulnerable to natural hazards than uh, the Netherlands is. We also see uh, trends uh, which are worrying on the political climate. And there are forecasts of a further polarization uh, in the political arena, uh, where we have NATO on the one side, uh, the BRICS, so uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, and China, roughly, uh, on the other side, and some uh, smaller uh, parties, uh, neutral, uh, mostly uh, on the other side. So that is another trend which is worrying. We see also uh, trends in healthcare that has been uh, long existing. So huge gap between uh, quality of healthcare uh, between uh, a lot of uh, countries in Africa uh, which who have poor healthcare, where in both Korea and the Netherlands, and in general, in complete Europe, we have a very good healthcare. So, from a scientific point of view, we can analyze uh, trends, we can model them as signals, and we can do a, a time frequency analysis on these signals. And what we see with all these trends is an increased uh, Variance. So there are more extremes that we see, uh, and the extremes are maybe uh, the most worrying thing. Perhaps not even uh, the, the average of uh, the Earth temperature increasing, but we will have way more extremes which endanger us uh, at the relatively uh, short notice. I'm afraid. Another aspect what we've learned from uh, science is that communication is important and it's not so much the factual communication but communication of emotion as well so how are facts perceived by those who listen uh, and meanwhile we've shown that we can calculate uh, the, the the comprehensibility of our messages to people even up to an individual level and we can also calculate uh, and forecast the interest that uh, people will have in certain information. And with the current search engines like Google, people are more or less trapped into uh, finding more messages with roughly 
uh, the same tone and with uh, presenting the same facts, uh, which uh, fuels further polarization as well. With uh, regard to uh, prosperity, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, it could not be much better. It's even slightly better than Korea. So there is an excellent health education. We have in general a good governance. We have a lot of personal freedom. Uh, economic quality is, is top notch and so forth. Nevertheless, also there are worrying trends. So also in the Netherlands, people worry about energy. Uh, they cannot uh, pay their bills anymore because uh, the energy prices in the Netherlands are the highest of the complete globe. Uh, people in the Netherlands are worried about the international tensions and uh, farmers uh, cannot uh, produce our food anymore because of the drought, and it is very far from the drought in Africa, but still uh, it is problematic, even already in the Netherlands. So this causes a lot of unrest of uh, issues in society, because people mention, even in such a rich country as the Netherlands, that they cannot pay for their food, that they cannot uh, go to a sports club, that they cannot uh, pay the rent. So this results in increasing unrest, uh, riots, demonstrations, and so forth. And people tend to take less and less perspective of uh, people outside their own community. They seem to lack a part of empathy. So we, from science we know we can distinguish empathy in three dimensions, emotion, cognition, and motor empathy. So we can express empathy, we can understand other people's emotions, and we can feel them. But with the globalization of our societies, uh, that tends to get lost and we mostly focus on the cognitive aspect of emotions, which is threatening as, uh, as uh, human beings. So my take home message is that something has to change in human behavior. It's not sustainable as it is. We can do very advanced modeling of high dimensional non-stationary da data streams. We can analyze trends. Science is not sufficient. We have to take care of good communication, capture uh, interest of people, make messages comprehensible. In the Netherlands, prosperity is highly ranked. However, people are dissatisfied. Uh, and politicians, they reason over a small time window, with, which is not a comfortable thought. And empathy is vital. Science can even augment it. Uh, and perhaps that's very much needed because it tends to get lost. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. That was very interesting, I guess. So I will save the questions for later times. And our next speaker. Next, Dr. Loss. Larson. Hey, thank you. Let me just share my screen. 네, 제... Okay, can you give me a short feedback if you can see my slides? Uh, yes, we can see it. Yes, I see well, okay. Lars. Perfect. Great. Mm -hmm. um, I just have the problem that I hear myself. Okay, now it's stopped. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, to the session. Um, I'm Lars Larsen, the German Aerospace Center. Let me just briefly introduce the German Aerospace Center and what we are doing. 
Uh, we are a research institution uh, of the Federal Republic of Germany, and yeah, we have different research areas like aeronautics, space, energy, transport, and security. And we are also a space agency for the Federal Republic of Germany, and we are also a project management agency. And we have uh, one, about 10,000 uh, employees all over Germany. We have different sites. And I'm working in the south of Germany at the Center for Lightweight Production Technology in Augsburg near Munich. And our main research focus is on um, automation, uh, on the research on automation processes. And yeah, what are the challenges for us in automation and why is this uh, such an interesting uh, topic at the moment? So what you can see here on the right side is a typical production process in the aerospace industry at the moment. Here you can see the production of a rear pressure bulkhead of an aircraft and uh, this part is made of carbon fiber composite and what you can see here is that workers have to put cut pieces in different sizes into uh, a production mold and yeah we have a lot of uh, challenges for the aerospace we have comparatively low production volume uh, the component size can be very large we have regular design updates we have a very high variability of specialized parts. We have high requirements concerning the accuracy. It's strongly cost driven. We have high, very high per item costs. And many current production processes are dominated by manual labor. So the best practices for automation exist for, from the automotive industry but they are not established in the aerospace production environments. So uh, our job is to automate these processes. Here, for example, you can see some uh, photos from our lab and what you saw on the slide before, the production of the rear pressure bucket, we showed that it's possible to automate these processes uh, with robots. And yeah, now let's come to the connection to the topic of the sessions. The, yeah, the actual situation in Germany is also yeah, really bad. The news are full of bad headlines according a Ukrainian war and sanction, lack of gas, rising prices of energy, delivery bottleneck, climate change, aridity, fire and flood, corona and recession and the stock index continues to slide. So at the moment, the typical news site uh, looks like this. This one is a German uh, online uh, a news site. And if you open the site, normally I do this every morning, but at the moment it doesn't make really fun. So you have the first message, recession will come. Uh, many, many billions third German relief package by the um, German government, uh, gas price rises, stock exchange price drops. So they are just bad news. And you even have the possibility to filter by bad news, for example, Ukrainian war, Corona or climate crisis. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really not uh, no fun. And yeah, as we heard before, the prices for the electricity, for example, sevenfolded in the last year, diesel doubled, fuel oil uh, is four times the price from the year before, steel prices rise up, the inflation rose up 7.9% in the last year. So that's really hard for the industry and it really leads to essential problems for the companies if they do not change their production. And yeah, of course, we also suffer from uh, Corona, from the impact of Corona, um, but Corona had 
also one good point um, because we started to work digi digitally. We made home office, we ordered more online, we started virtual events. That was positive, but it also showed that in Germany we are lagging behind in digitalization. And we also saw that the social inequality has become apparent and has increased. For example, among children who do not have notebooks or stuff like that. And it really showed that it's necessary to consider social factors such, such as the society and its individuals when it comes to digitalization. And yeah, Industry 4.0 has mainly put the focus on connecting machines. And yeah, uh, Industry 5.0 now addresses the point of the society. So in, before the robots were historically, they did dangerous and monotonous or physically demanding work such as welding and painting. And in Industry 5.0, the robot comes more to the human being and it refers to people working alongside with robots and smart machines it helps robots and humans to work together and thus faster adds a personal human touch to the industry 4.0 pillars and highlights the importance of research and innovation to support the industry so that's my last slide i think um, industry 5.0 zero sets the bar very high and yeah experts all over the world should cooperate to go one step um, up, up, up approach and yeah korea has a very high uh, number of industrial robots per one ten thousand employees so i think it would be very nice to cooperate in some projects so that was my presentation and i'm happy to get questions. Thank you for your presentation. Now let's move on to the fourth presenter. Hello. Professor Kolias will present on the AI, the European vision and energy crisis. Professor Kolias, please go on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, give me one moment as well. Okay, uh, yes, this is the title of this talk. Um, let me try to give you a summary of what has happened in, in, in Europe uh, in the last three years. Uh, we had on the one hand uh, this unpredicted crisis, which uh, started in 2020 following the appearance of COVID-19 worldwide. We had the uh, last crisis and great problems in the economy due to impose restrictions, isolation, health problems, deaths. In Greece, that were getting out of a large recession period, we, this also caused problems to our started recovery. And however, to funding according to the, that were consistent with the EU policy was given to, to, to face this. And uh, this uh, made it a bit uh, uh, slighter. And uh, in parallel, great effort was given for the digitalization, the transformation of Greece. And this uh, emp was empowered by the remote working, the, the learning uh, from the distance learning and all this uh, activity. Uh, of course, in 2022, we, the following the war in Ukraine, um, large, mainly energy crisis uh, produced uh, great rises in energy rates, causing social and industrial problems. Uh, similarly, the, the state provides assistance to users of low income, but it's unpredictable how the next winter will be with respect to this continuation. In parallel, uh, we had a great rise in the AI development in Europe. Uh, starting in 2019, a great focus was given to what was called the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI, uh, building trust in AI systems, uh, producing recommendations for trustworthy AI. This was, conti this was continued in 2020 with uh, uh, reports on Data Governance Act, uh, the declaration of digital society and value-based uh, governance and governance and then in 2021 we got, we got rules for AI, revised coordinated plan and uh, 
and now there have been national strategies at European level for uh, large funding of AI activities in the public and private sector. So we have the problems and possibly a possible way of, of uh, tackling some of them through AI. Uh, the vision, the European vision of AI is to accelerate innovation by leveraging inclusive AI. That means putting AI at the service of people and the climate and the environment uh, to foster creativity, economic growth, a digital transformation and create a technology enabled future that will be more democratic, equitable and for good for all and for the common good. Uh, one of the targets we had uh, it is AI for climate and environment, climate and environment. That means that greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55 percent by 2020, 30. And to develop and use energy efficient approaches, optimize connectivity to energy, efficient management of resources, energy water, energy water and soil biodiversity. And I think uh, here AI is a good uh, means, a good tool for producing, for helping and uh, advancing the en energy, cons and reducing energy consumption and uh, making the facing many of the problems we already mentioned. I give you a couple of uh, examples that we already have implemented the testing uh, at, at, at some scale uh, when I was in UK and uh, now in Greece. The first few cases is uh, we can use AI to control, for example, to control the food retailing refrigeration systems. Uh, what's the target? It is to predict uh, in big supermarkets which refrigerators to select and how long to turn them off whilst maintaining food quality and safety in a demand side response setting that modifies power demand load proportional to available energy. Uh, that means how we can do this? We can collect data about the defrost time uh, across uh, uh, supermarkets and their uh, refrigerators, uh, link that to the temperature patterns that were former to defrost time, and produce models, train uh, uh, machine learning systems to predict the defrost duration in the refrigerator systems in different locations. So we can have various models and with using them we can reduce the energy consumption and CO2 production while keeping food safe, helping big supermarkets organize, reduce errors and avoid paying, paying big, big fines. Uh, just to give you an idea of what this is about, we have in the cloud a back-end deep learning framework where we collect data from the local uh, supermarket stores and so on and we create, uh, we train the, the, the models to predict the defrost times in different conditions. So we have here many uh, deep learning models with which we feed, with, with which we feed the local supermarkets which they have the, the local databases and uh, the data and uh, so they can use them for automating this procedure. We have used this uh, in a test bed in, uh, in uh, the Tesco supermarkets in the UK uh, with uh, more than 1,000 uh, 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 they, they have of them stores. And we have obtained very good prediction, accuracy of prediction where the defrost will come. If you see these curves, it shows that the prediction is on the spot very good, with very good accuracy on where this uh, where the defrost period uh, starts, uh, stops, and so we have to, 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 to get back uh, the, the energy uh, at the normal uh, temperature. So I, uh, this is one issue that can really help uh, reduce energy, help uh, use this power for, uh, so to avoid uh, having problems both, both in the industry and also at home. And of course, to do this, a second use case is to, to predict the, the, to forecast the load demand, the power load demand. So uh, here we, we want to predict anomalies, that means to predict instances where the power demand load gets higher than the available power. So here again we collect historical data on power demand, available power, and predict the ratio, that means power demand over available power, for one day ahead. In this case, we also train deep neural networks for this prediction. We also obtain very high accuracies. The impact here is also 
the one percentage increase in the forecast error, if we have error of the power system, this will produce an increase of costs of, most than, of more than 10 million pounds per year. So we see that uh, AI, machine learning, can uh, be uh, used greatly among uh, different application sectors and produce, for example, energy, reduce the energy consumption uh, with focus on where it can be done with safety and for the good of the people. Uh, that's for my, for the moment, I thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor. Next presenter is Faj Karelainen. The floor is yours. Dr. Karelainen. Hey, hello. Oh. Uh, okay, thank you for inviting me. Uh, when Yonghua asked me to give this speech, my first reaction was that I'm not any expert in this area. Isn't this uh, more a job of social scientists or politicians? However, I decided to look a bit deeper to the topic and understood that there is no solutions without participation. We all are responsible to make the best we can. I modified a little the topic sent by Yong I added a phrase, some historical references to increase our understanding of non-military defense. This is also the most important part of this little study. Reactions to the question raised by Yong I think, must be something we can call defense. We are scientists and researchers. We don't carry guns. Defense must be non-violent. I will be, I will briefly show you what I have found. First of all, it's really good time to ask this question in Finland today. We have lived in peace since World War II with all our neighbors. Former Soviet Union and modern Russia have been our most important trading partners since today. Then one morning, February 24th, we hear that Russia has attacked Ukraine. This is the title I found one morning in the newspaper. Finland ran out of Jordan templates. In a few days, it was clear that Finland has to apply NATO. We did it actually together with Swedish neighbors. Sweden has been neutral and not allied about 200 years before this. Now in Finland, I can see rearmament and militarism rising. Young people are invited to extra military refresher courses. Of course, this is natural because most Finnish males have been in military service. However, the question is if there exist any references, how we should act as scientists. How can research maintain peace in the world? And because we are scientists, we should do some scientific uh, <coughs> investigations. Perhaps we should look back in the history, try to find some theoretical evidence to our possible solutions. Uh, like I said, I'm a layman in peace studies, but the next are the most impressive pieces of history of pacifism and anti-militarism I have met. I have attached here Finnish prints of a few books because they are actually all from my bookshelf, my personal bookshelf. Anyway, I'm sure that you recognize many of those persons and, and, and faces. One of the first authorities is Immanuel Kant. He postulated conditions to keep peace. Uh, not all of them are usable today. It's not very realistic to believe that we can police the army in the very near future. But there is also many, many good advices, like it is not a good idea to poison your, your uh, enemies, for example. Leo Tolstoy is well-known pacifist. 
His short political novels are very good reading today. Actually, it seems that Russia repeats some historical mistakes it has done already a hundred years ago. His fear about dangers of patriotism and nationalism are also very up to date. They are in all European countries up to date. Karl Liebknecht is giving us insight to political situation of previous century. Maybe one can see some historical connections to today's left-right uh, left politics and so on. Maybe best known pacifist in the world in history is Mahatma Gandhi. He gives us face to non-violence non -violence and passive resistance, which are usable uh, also today. Most important message of Karl Polanyi for me is that when you economize the society, you must take into account the local and cultural differences. It, be, might, it might be one of the most important reasons for conflict to offer political and economical causes to people that are not used to them. This is especially true for developing countries. Uh, Johan Kaltung's book, Non-Military Defense Strategies, opened my eyes in many ways. I understood that because the violence can be, like, like he said, structural violence, where preventing people to fulfill, fulfill their basic needs by e.g. institutions, cultural violence, existence of social norms that make, make direct and structural violence seems acceptable like slavery, or direct violence, killing, torture, sexual violence. Defense by non-violence can also be multiform. From all these sources, historical sources, I conclude and will summarize the most important point I have found. From Kant, I understood that respect of international agreements is quite old and reasonable demand. There should be, not be cultural excuses not to obey agreements. Actually, some people see that Russians do not need to do that because they have not done it earlier. From Tolstoy, I learned that even Russian can be anti-nationalist and anti-patriot. It's also clear that nationalism and patriotism has been a problem in Europe more than 100 years. Nowadays, it's a very big problem. Polanyi showed me that you have to be realistic when you offer your political or economical system to other cultures. From Galtung, I select the concept of positive nonviolence. What, what I can do as scientist or researcher is to be in the contact with my colleagues in violent countries. Seclusion or internment not working methods because you lose the possibility to have impact to situation. This was my message. Thank you. Okay, Komasumida. Uh, Thank you. Last but not least, we have Dr. Zhou Wu Hyun. Research Corporation, it is a private. Director Zhou Wuyun will present Strengthening Korea EU Research Cooperation. Director, please go on. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Kim. I'm Zhou Wuyun from KERC, Korea EU Research Center, and hi, I'm here in Brussels, Belgium. Uh, for your better understanding, uh, I will talk in Korean. So what I want to talk today is how to strengthen the Korea-EU research cooperation. My contents today So I will talk about now why R&D collaboration is needed. So this is the world we are living in. Many presenters have already talked about that. We face many uh, issues and problems. One thing is, of course, the climate change. 
the first picture is Nevada Death Valley flood from last month. So Death Valley, actually, I I visited several times there. A national park, very hot and dry desert. So, and I heard from last month news that actually there was a flood and road were destroyed. Second picture, Netherlands from last month again, from a, a boat, parking parking space. So the drought now in Europe is very very uh, hard struck. France, uh, Spain is seeing a lot of wildfire because of the dry atmosphere, and one of that. Is the third picture, the southern part of the France, a wildfire picture. So that's all from the drought. And now they are actually locking down、uh, the fountains in the parks, and and France, ninety percent of their all territory actually have a drought warning, and the crop damage is very very high. The rivers are drying. And actually, we've seen the sunk battleships from World War Two. And Korea had a lot, a lots of rain very recently. Recently, in Belgium here, actually, we started to see some rain today. We have some rain, so I hope that the drought will ease a little bit. So the fourth picture here is again from last year, from Do- it- Italy, Dolomiti. So. The iceberg is actually melting down, and it took lives of seven、uh, civilians. So, actually, I can show you more, more and more of pictures from、uh, these climate changes. I'm not a professional for climate, so I'm not going to talk about how can we solve that. But maybe from socio-political、uh, point of view,、uh, or maybe there are some、uh, f- that we can fr-、uh, search from、uh, R and Ds. From science, so one of the example here, the COVID pandemic that locked down everyone、uh, globally. So two months ago, I was a forum in the UK, and they were talking about R and D collaboration actually will make innovation. Enterprises, research institutes, universities, authorities, and ac- academia needs to be together. For one specific goal. So again, a goal is needed for an R and D team to form. And the result,、uh, the vaccine used to take nine years to develop, but we succeeded to develop a vaccine only in nine months. So that was an R and D innovation. So of course that was a vaccine in the UK, but still, if we have a clear goal and collaboration, we can make an innovation. So this is some data from National Research Foundation. So there was it's it's a ten year cycle. Number of Nobel Prize winners: physics, chemistry, physiology, or medicine. So, which means that as time goes by, we start having new perspective. And when there's a collaboration, the outcome is very good. So that was the conclusion. Below, there is a EU missions in Horizon Europe. And. Again, we've seen many、uh, funds flow in. First is climate change. Second, cancer. Three, restoring waters for smart city. So this is the points that Horizon Europe is supporting already. As you're well aware, most of the things they do in Horizon Europe is country to country R and D collaboration. So the basic of Horizon Europe is、uh, country to country cooperation. Now I will mention briefly about KERC. So we started in 2013 at Belgium. So we are actually focusing on promoting R and D collaboration with、uh, Korea and EU. We do information sharing. We do networking, and we do pathfinding for younger. Uh, scientist, and 
Next, we do a national coordinator role. It's called also NCP. These are our recent performance performances. Next, I will briefly talk about Horizon Europe and uh, its collaboration with Korea. I'm sure you are all well aware of Horizon Europe. I will only mention that it's an EU framework program. And this, again, you've seen this page somewhere else, I believe. So there is a lot of platforms, and there are many pillars. And in EU, the governance has already become a major pillar here. Next page. It's Korea from FP7 to Horizon Europe. How uh, Korea evolved. So you can see here budget, the number of participation has all, all, all increased. And Korea, Korea ranks 13th in the third party countries, not non-EU countries. The number uh, of success rate is very much above the EU level, 18% over 15%. Uh, last year's data shows it's actually 20% of the success rate, which means that Korea is actively participating in these programs. So that was just a data. This page shows Korea's exploratory talk. It is now going on. And Korea and Japan is doing this. And I have high expectations on this. So if uh, Korea becomes an associated country, Korea can uh, more actively participate in Horizon Europe. And this is what I am working right now. So we can do more active things in the future. So more than Horizon 2020. We can go in uh, many uh, applications and that will open us new uh, horizons further. Last page, KERC's role as an NCP, which shows that we will strengthen more our role uh, as an NCP. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Director, very much. So we started in Korea, and then we reached Belgium, uh, Germany, Netherlands, Greece, Finland, and we've heard many uh, good opinions, global opinions. So personally, actually, uh, I feel very good to see all of our presenters. Although it's online, then we will start our discussion session. For seamless proceeding, I will speak in English. Ask Professor Egon van den Broek uh, in Holland. Hi, Egon. Hi. Nice to see you again, Egon. Yeah. You introduced the interesting uh, statistics of um, prosperity index. Um, and um, according to this uh, Legatum prosperity index, the two uh, the top tens are always occupied by uh, northern European countries, as you know, such as uh, Denmark, Sweden, and uh, Norway, Holland, or so, Finland, and so on. So I wonder, what is the reason? Could it be uh, explained by empathy, what you mentioned, uh, too, or any other um, viewpoints? Egon? Yeah, so, so uh, at least uh, I can try to give an explanation for the Netherlands. So uh, it, it is in uh, the history of the Netherlands that there has been a lot of colonization. So uh, they just occupied a lot of other countries throughout the complete globe and extracted a lot of wealth uh, from this uh, generated a lot of business, which uh, yeah, g gave tremendous profits uh, to, to the Netherlands, uh, which allowed to build uh, yeah, the, the current uh, high prosperity. Um, and then with respect to empathy, so uh, the colonization uh, enslaved people. So uh, you, that I would argue that's a clear lack of empathy. So, uh, and yeah, 
So, and, and, and perhaps you could even uh, generalize uh, uh, these historical events to, to, to current trends of other countries that make uh, some more vulnerable countries uh, dependent on them. That's it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, um, okay, the time is gone. <laughs> So, flying. Next, I would like to ask to uh, Dr. Lars Larsen. Hello, Lars, and hello, Servus. Lange nicht gesehen. Also, es ist schön dich zu sehen. Okay. So, um, regarding the first industrial uh, revolution, we 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 are saying uh, the Germany uh, 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 German industry uh, 4.0 is still a hot topic everywhere. Actually, uh, the Industry 4.0 is a part of a high-tech strategy 2020 of the German uh, government. And uh, you, you mentioned in your presentation, um, Industry uh, 5.0. Could you tell us what uh, the main difference between uh, Industry 4.0 and uh, the new 5.0, please? No acoustic. Oh, sorry, Jongwa. Okay, it's great. Nah, okay, I, I, I said servus before, uh, but, but you didn't hear it. So sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, the main uh, uh, difference is industry 4.0 uh, was to interconnect machine, make them more smart, use technologies like IoT, Internet of Things, or artificial intelligence or cyber physical systems. And industry 5.0 takes the efficiency from industry 4.0 a step further, but it focuses more on the human being, more on the on the on the yeah on the on the worker. And yeah, that's the main difference. So yeah, it, industry 5.0 was directly created when Corona started and when uh, the government saw that the human being is also very important. Okay, okay, thank you. Let's pass now a microphone to Professor Stefanos Kolias in, uh, in Greece. Hi Stefanos, uh, nice to see you. Hi, hi Nice hey. to see you. Hey. <laughs> Thank you for your valuable um, presentation first. Um, I think uh, no matter how fast, how fast the um, artificial intelligence advances, uh, human beings uh, should always be at the center of this AI, right? Uh, especially in its applications. We all agree on that. Nevertheless, uh, it is also obvious uh, that uh, AI will be uh, somehow used in uh, negative things in some places, for example, to win wars and so on. On the other hand, um, intentionally and criminally biased AI is also very problematic. Do you have any thought uh, for this issue, Stefanos? Uh, thank you very much for this question. I think it is... Uh... It is within the issues we have to continuously monitor and think uh, how to, to compete with that. Uh, you know, uh, think about cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is on the one hand, uh, we have organizations that have all the, the people, and on the, one, on the other side, we have the, the cyber and all the crime, the possible crime. And the, the technologies used are continuously evolving. So it is, uh, you know, a continuous, uh, competition and uh, contest between uh, us, between uh, uh, the two sides. And so I think this will continue. Uh, we have, uh, but we have a lot of uh, tools in our hands that will continue uh, developing and, and using this framework. First, uh, the authentication strategies are continuing, continuously uh, evolving. We now everything in order to, to, to get something uh, you need uh, to, to respond from your mobile. But moreover, what I presented earlier about uh, AI developments, for example, in Europe, uh, the, the targets are to, to have, uh, uh, to include uh, uh, tools like, uh, or properties like fairness, 
explainability and trustworthiness. That means we would like to that the system, when interacting with the person, with the with the public uh, uh, citizens, uh, has to persuade them so that they trust. I think these issues are the tools we are going to con to use in this context and this probable uh, possible uh, uh, problems that we we'll face. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan Stefanos. Um, we move to um, Finland, Professor Pazi Kalialainen. Hi, Pazi. Hello, Jan. Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Ukraine war is uh, still ongoing, and um, in particular, you as a Finnish, I think uh, you have a lot of things you want to say. And uh, especially for you, you can give any comments and messages related to Ukraine war. And um, any comments are welcome. Well, to start, uh, I think that this is very, very strange situation because really, like I said, we have been in peace since World War II. And, and uh, Sweden has been without war even even longer time, and and in very very fast cycle we are going to NATO, which is it it was almost impossible for example for Swedish people. So I, I think that it's very complicated to understand what Mr. Putin wants because. This is something that wouldn't happen any any time without these wars. So it's it's very mysterious thing. But we are trying to give all help to Ukrainian people. I I think that after this war, someday it will be a day that we also need to collaborate all together with Russia also. So I I, I hope really that we are not lo losing everything in the world. Anyway, we have only two countries where we travel. We can travel with a train, and now we have only Sweden left. So I hope the best. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. And um, next, Director Jo Hyun. So, Dr. Cho is at Belgium and you're doing a lot of work there. Thank you very much. So, you briefly mentioned that Korea-EU collaboration. Is there anything you can uh, show us? Maybe something you can uh, show to us what's going on? Or maybe you can introduce the EU's, uh, EU's uh, bodies and you can introduce them to Korea, or you have some a, pro, a program, something like that. Maybe anything you can show us. So I will be very brief. Korea and EU, the R&D collaboration, uh, actually it's not very active compared to US, uh, Japan, and other countries. Still, Europe, Korea to France, Korea to, to UK, Korea to EU, actually there's a support for that in basic science. And recently, uh, other than this bilateral program, we are going much more into the Horizon program. So KERC will act as an NCP to, to actually uh, know what the EU wants. And we are doing a lot of things to make collaborations. And actually, there were a lot of collaborations in the past. But still, like I mentioned, becoming a, an associate country uh, is an important thing and after that's done we will have many more things and uh, Korean programs there are a lot of bilateral programs that EU might uh, want but there's a thing called rainfall it's done in, in NRF and many countries uh, from many countries uh, the researchers visit Korea and can do collaboration they can teach the university students so it's a good opportunity. From U.S., we have a lot of researchers visiting Korea, but there are less 
uh, visitors from the EU. So I want to mention that. If you are interested, please uh, have a look at that. Thank you very much. So actually, uh, we're in uh, Korea, but still, we are doing this uh, for uh, Europe also, for our six panelists. Actually, it's a, uh, it can be very hard for us to actually meet you. So I believe this forum is quite a venue for meeting you. So Professor Che, we've heard a lot of presentation and opinions. And you mentioned that going to bed early, getting up early, that's not a that's not a remedy for energy saving or environmental issues for all, but I just want to hear more comments. When I was preparing for my keynote speech as a scientist, I had a chance to look back of what I've done. There are millions of millions of scientists around the globe. There have been, and they are actively working on their research. Then what kind of benefits have we made from our research as a scientist? Rather, it felt like we worked on our research to destroy the environment. That's how I felt. Edison was my all-time favorite and world-class scientist. However, at the end of the day, because Edison invented how to use electricity, we have destroyed a great portion of the environment. So it's because we had a certain responsibilities of the environmental issues. We can also utilize the resource, human resources of the scientists around the globe in order to tackle climate change. And that, that I believe our future tasks and duty as scientists. So far, scientists have worked for human, but now it's time to work for the global uh, Mother Earth. For example, if you think of a Nobel Prize, We should focus on the universal value that any of the research has if that research is uh, if that research deserves a Nobel Prize. So now it's the time to do our research for Earth as we have done our research for humans so far. And there should be some changes in our research pattern. And there must be some kind of a statement that we have to gather around the globe for the research of, for the uh, Mother Earth. Thank you very much. We wish that we could have more time to collect questions from the audience, but I apologize for that shortage of time. In particular, some of the some of our colleagues in Europe are in a very early morning time zone, but we sincerely appreciate your participation. And uh, Stefano is from Greece. Dr. Joe or from Belgium. Thank you so much, guys, and um, I hope uh, you uh, stay healthy, and I'm really sure that uh, we uh, see you again soon. 
Once again, thank you, everyone, especially for the audience and the floor. And that wraps up the session under the topic of the uh, Korea EU Roundtable. Thank you. Have a great evening. 그럼 이것으로 세션을 마치겠습니다. 잠시 휴식 시간을 가진 뒤 계속해서 다음 세션이 진행될 예정이오니 많은 참여 부탁드립니다. 감사합니다. Thank you all for such remarkable talks. Then this concludes our session. After having 30 minutes break, we will come back to another session. We would like to ask for your continuous support and interest. Thank you.